computer. Wonderful. All right, guys, welcome. We don't have music group tonight, so we get this quiet background. Yeah, nice. Shout out to music group, though. We love <laughs> it. We love, <laughs> love you guys. You remember, um, it's recording. <laughs> it's recording. Um, I'm excited you guys are here. We got our sports nutrition chat today. So I'm excited about that because there's a lot of things we need to talk about. And um, But to start, let's go ahead. We're just going to go around the room briefly, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to point this at you. Mr. Andrew and Blake, um, but let's do name um, and something that, like last time, either something that's kind of stuck out to you over the past couple nutrition classes and or that you've been working on specifically for your own nutrition, things that have like been helpful. You want to go ahead? Yeah, Andrew, I, I would say, because I actually asked you about how many meals you said in a day, and so then you kept saying, no, just eat whatever you feel hungry, so I just been focusing on that, and not overeating, just eating until I feel like I'm so you, it was something about like you know, yeah like the hunger time. scale yeah hunger, yeah hunger pulse scale so just making sure I'm not you know overeating and then uh, just being mindful about what my body's telling me and just listening to my body that's right you know, it's telling you important things yeah. good I like that thank you Blake first timer good to see you um maybe um share with us something personal that you're working on your nutrition or it could be something that you're interested in learning about tonight um well i am personally trying to balance my food for energy recovery and vanity <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, i like it um i mean that's i just uh i don't know i i think this is pretty i'm a sponge when it comes to this i'm excited and i'm having a hard time because i i live an active lifestyle and i have a very physical job and so it's it's really hard to balance like not overeating because I feel like my body's dying and starving all the time. <laughs> <laughs> hey, God, so. well, we're gonna talk about a lot of those things and, and how to adjust for your um, you know, your personal activity factor for your day and like how, how to adjust that for yourself versus someone else who's got a totally different lifestyle. So I'm excited. Okay. Thank you. Um Sean. And uh, one thing that I've been actually really working on is my snacking in between meals. I remember Henry and I were talking about candy <laughs> and whatnot. And I've been buying like, I've been trying to buy like cliff bars or like protein bars, stuff like that to substitute for Doritos and Sour yeah. Patch Kids. Cause yeah. sitting at a desk at my job all day, um, it's, it's tough because it's just like I can just reach for food right here on my desk. And so you're changing up your environment, which is important because, yeah, yeah if you, if no, you I'm trying not candy. to have food on my desk, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. only water or coffee. Okay, I like that. Yeah, yeah. putting the, and then and then being around foods that are gonna help support you better than other things. Yeah, and if I get hungry in between lunch and when I leave, because that's when I always snack. Is Right after lunch, if I don't eat a big enough lunch or don't think I eat a big enough lunch, I'll get like chips or something. Mm -hmm. And then in between lunch and when I leave work, I end up eating like a bag, like a full bag of chips mm -hmm. and a bunch of candy. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. <laughs> like every day. <laughs> you are a skateboarder. <laughs> yeah. That's my brother. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks for sharing that. So I'm going to move this. And uh, Ramsey. Hi, I'm Ramsey. Um, <clears throat> what I took away from last week was. You should be drinking half your body weight in ounces of water per day. So right? what is that for you about, or what are you trying to I'm aim like for? I'm like 163, so that's like 81 and a half ounces, and I don't get close to that. Whoa. Have yeah. you been like more mindful about your I have. I, I, I only drink water now, to be totally oh. honest, and coffee. Yeah, in the, <laughs> in the mornings, I have one big cup of coffee and water. With virtually another creamer that's super bad for you, but whatever. It's delicious. <laughs> it's a diuretic, right? But it's right for you. So, <laughs> so yeah. But yeah, I only have to yeah, glad you're being conscious of that. Yeah. Yes. Because it's very easy to forget about water throughout the day. And, and, and we are, yeah, I, I forget the percent. I think we're like, you know, we're over 70% water. Maybe that's the world, not us. It's like 72%. Like I think you're right. I think it's between it's it's in the 70s. So yeah, it's obviously important. And, and you know, just like plants, where 
like waters that vehicle to trip to transport nutrients we can think of ourselves kind of similarly where you know without without that water we're our inability we have an inability to transport nutrients where they need to go so that's a kind of a fun way to think about it and an important aspect to think about when it comes to hydration so let's go back to neil hey guys i'm neil um yeah one thing i've been kind of trying to practice is listen to my body more it's on the lines of the hunger scale um trying to find it where it is you know trying to get to about the six and then stop and wait and i'm fine versus just hurrying and getting to a nine and ten full and keep calling it mm -hmm. so i found if i wait it settles and i'm not as hungry as i thought i was yes yeah being more in, in mindful and intuitive with your hunger and That's right. life okay nate Okay. Um, well, one thing I was working on was so I like have some to go along with the meal prep meals. I have like some easy, quick meals that probably aren't the healthiest, but it's like ramen and like hamburger helper stuff to make when I don't have those meals. I was making my hamburger helper the other night, and while I was at the store the other day, I thought about like how all the different colors of vegetables mean like different nutrients and stuff. So I bought this really colorful pack peppers and I got these peppers out and I chopped them all up and like sauteed them and put them in my hamburger helper. Nice. And I was like, wow, look at me. <laughs> <laughs> also, <laughs> I love pistachios and the taste yeah. of like each individual pistachio is like mm -hmm. heaven no matter what. So yes. I will sit there and eat like an entire bag of them. And so I also was sitting there eating pistachios and I stopped and was like, how full am I? Am yeah. I and just eating these because I'm obsessed with the taste mm -hmm. or am I eating them because I'm hungry and it made me stop probably quicker than I would have. Awesome. I, I love that. Yeah. I love your that. celebration of getting each one out of the shell. <laughs> no, and I think that's so super important with like the pepper thing that you talked about because a lot of people think about like they don't realize or a lot of oftentimes we don't realize that by just adding some things to our current nutrition we can we can get a lot further. Like a lot of people think oh we have to if you totally get rid of the hamburger helper, it's like, no, the, like, you know, we're, if we're thinking about a spectrum and hamburger helpers maybe way to the left and then like having a giant, like vegetable and fruit laden, like salad with some protein, and whatnot, it's on the right. It's like, well, to get closer to that side of things, doesn't mean we have to get rid of the hamburger helper altogether. If we're just trying to look to improve, it's yeah. Adding, adding some vegetables to it, adding some other things to it that are going to provide us with more nutrients. And you know, it's, you can only add so much in before other things have to take a, you know, a step out. So if you just had a huge pan of hamburger helper, you'd probably eat the whole pan of it maybe. But then if you add in, the more things you add in, your, your, that volume is going to decrease because you're not going to be able to eat the whole pan when you add a bunch of stuff to it. So you're kind of inadvertently getting, you know, reducing the amount of just pure hamburger helper that you're eating and increasing, you know, nutrient dense foods. So that's awesome. I love that. Okay, Mason. Mason. Um, one thing I remember that stuck out was, I, I forgot if that Jesus said it, it might have been you, but just eating a bell pepper like an apple. I, I tried that the other day and it was good. Like Pretty good. Yeah. You got to be careful around the seeds. You yeah. like, don't want to make a huge mess, but usually. So it worked out really well. Good. Awesome. Cool. Okay, Christopher. I'm guessing that the idea of eating drinking after weight and water was like shocking to me and mm -hmm. I think I'd be really good quote as well. But I'm always wondering like, am I overeating or am I bulking? Because I want to get stronger. What's that like for me like so okay. yeah. Well and, and remind me to talk about that because I don't know if I have that on there, but well uh, I'll, I'll add that in like calorie yeah, now. So sure. calorie oh. needs. <laughs> okay. Cool, and then Henry. Oh, <laughs> hey, I'm Henry. Um, yeah, I think the, the fullness scale is what I've been paying attention to most, trying not to eat to 10 or 11 or 12, which also means like paying attention to like, like honoring when I am hungry, being okay to like eat. Because usually sometimes like at work, especially, I'll just kind of starve myself until lunch and then then feast during lunch. And then, I don't know, now I'm just like actually take, having snacks. I'm not fasting as much. I'm just kind of like eating when I'm hungry because 
you know, I work out a lot and my job is really physical. I don't get, the only time I get down is when I'm sitting down to eat. I'm on my feet, like mm-hmm. lifting heavy shit all day. So, um, yeah. Good. Yeah, because I think we talked about that where, you know, if you are fasting, there's, there's certainly some benefits to fasting, whether that's, um, you know, metabolic benefits or, um, or, physiolog- or physiological or metabolic or, um, you know, just for other various reasons. But the issues that come up with oftentimes with fasting is that if you are going into your first meal very unprepared sometimes if you don't have a game plan. So if you're, you're using that fasting time, you're like, okay, well, I fasted all morning and then you are ravenous and don't have a good game plan for lunch and you just eat the whole house for lunch and you with reckless abandon or you have no game plan. It's just like whatever food you see, you eat, then you're worse off. Right. So a lot of people ask me about fasting and it's kind of like, well, it depends on, you know, your goals and your lifestyle, of course. But at the same time, it's like, if you are someone who's just winging meals, I think the fasting is probably a very poor idea for that individual. Um, cause they'd be better off planning and eating before they're hungry, before they've had like a, a giant fast, if that makes sense. So, um, Nice. I like that, Henry. And then um, let's go to Andy, and then we'll go to you, Serena. What's something you guys have been working on or been focused on in particular this past? Yeah. um, So last week, um, you know, in particular, talking about the goals and the SMART goals, um, which is actually something that I've done quite a bit. So what really stuck up to me last week about the goals was making a plan for those goals and then um, potential obstacles and barriers and, and really, you know, uh, making that plan more specific and concrete. So, um, you know, creating the shopping list, actually preparing out the meals, thinking about, you know, when, when I'm getting, you know, cravings for kind of crappy food and how to handle that and planning things in advance. So. Awesome. Thanks for bringing that up, Andy. Cause yeah, we did do a, a, a good portion on smart goals and thanks for bringing that up. So I'm glad, I'm glad you've been focused on that. All right. And then Serena. Um, what I was thinking about was <clears throat> cause I tried super low carb for a few weeks. Um, and I wasn't able to perform in the gym, but then, um, you mentioned, that it's really not that sustainable. And when you do start to add carbs back in, if you're not subtracting other things, then there you are with this big pile of food. Like it's just, so not only did I not feel very good, it wasn't sustainable. And so I've just been thinking about how to be more well-rounded. And I've actually been thinking about the my plate thing a little bit, so. I'm really glad I'm doing this workshop. Awesome. Yay. That makes me happy. And, and, um, you know, it all comes down to, it all comes down to the habits that you're building long-term, right? Which we talked about. So yeah, if you find that your, you know, your low carb is not sustainable and then you revert back to old habits, you know, now you've got worse habits on top of old habits, which, you know, aren't serving you. So, um, so thanks Thanks, Serena. Um, and then for me, something I've been working on, um, I've been working on packing, packing meals, planning my days out better here since I am here for um, a pretty good chunk of time um, most days. So, you know, just being better about planning, being better about um, taking time to, to prep for those meals on the weekends and, um, yeah, having good food in my house because now that especially if it's only one person, sometimes you're like, oh, I can put off grocery shopping until tomorrow, then tomorrow comes out, oh, I'll put it off. And then, you know, then you're scrounging for what you have available in your pantry. And usually that's not, you know, those aren't the best food options. So just trying to have a better plan and realizing that it really does all start in, with, you know, what you have on hand, your, your grocery shopping or, or things you stack up in your house. Um, so I'm really excited. I'm gonna move this to make sure you guys can read the board a little bit better. But I'm excited to talk about um, our sports nutrition or performance nutrition today uh, because there's a lot of things to talk about. And I, and I keep seeing people with various, you know, bringing various things to the gym or finishing the gym and, um, you know, maybe not having the best uh, food options or post-workout recovery options with them. Um, I try to stock the fridge downstairs with good food options that either are serving you, you know, pre-workout, post-workout. Um, so usually those are pretty good 
you know, fair, fair game. Um, but I think a couple things that I want to start off with, and we can kind of, we'll, we'll take it at a couple different angles today, but just obviously we talked about the macronutrients a couple of classes ago, and we've kind of hit on them each time. So what are, what are your three macronutrients that we talked about? For the Protein, fat, carbohydrates. Yep, protein, fat, carbohydrates. So we've kind of talked about why they're necessary just for all around health. Um, and we have them here on these handouts here. But I want to talk, focus a little bit more on them today for what their role is in performance. And then therefore, you know, how we translate that into our fueling and our recovery pre and post workout. So um, as you can see on this handout, and for those of you, you know, for um, those of you just watching this, I'll have these on on hand at the gym so you can always ask me for those um but i think it's as we talked about last time and as you said serena carbohydrates are going to be that you know they're so important because they really are the fuel the primary fuel source for our muscles for muscle contraction um and so and then we also talked about how the brain requires glucose or you know and or carbohydrate glucose is the simplest form of carbohydrate so those terms might be used interchangeably but the brain actually really relies on carbohydrate as well for that mental focus and acuity. So I have that on here under your carbohydrate section as well. Um, so we talked about examples of carbs, but what, uh, what, what do you guys remember? I mean, obviously it's part of the machine, sheet, but what are like some very minimally processed carbohydrate sources um, of food? Brown rice. Brown rice? Okay. What does that fall under to my category standpoint? What are rices and carbohydrate? Well, sorry, grain. Grain, yeah. Whole <laughs> grain, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. What's another type of carbohydrate? Oatmeal. Oh, oatmeal. Yep. Oatmeal. Oats. We yep. miles here for that. What were you saying, uh, Jim or Andrew? No, I was saying sweet potatoes. Sweet potatoes. Yep. So we got our starchy vegetables. What are other starchy vegetables? So we talked about. Yep. So white potatoes, sweet potatoes. Squash is not, and so actually, someone asked me, Matt asked me actually this at the class, like, I just wrap, try and wrap my head around like squash and zucchini being starchy vegetable. And I was like, actually, so the squash and zucchini, the yellow squash and zucchini, those are those would not be considered starchy vegetables. I was thinking more like acorn squash, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, um, okay, so we've got, and then there's, I'm thinking of one more priority category. We have like our whole grains or grains, of course. We've got our starchy vegetables. Sugar, um, fruits, yeah. Yeah, we, we got fruits, which have natural sugars. And then, of course, yeah, we have our breads. Breads. And uh, like our, our more, more processed, um, more processed carbohydrates. <laughs> but fruit's a big one. So fruit is, fruit is absolutely, fruit is a very easy, and we'll talk about this later, but especially if you're thinking about packing healthy meals or snacks pre and post workout. Fruit's one of the easiest options to bring with us and doesn't require any prep. Um, okay, so let's, so we've got that on here. Um, let's move on to fat. So in terms of fat, we, we talked about in Serena, what you meant, what you, um, what you mentioned um, was that, yeah, high fat is not really gonna be serving you all from a, performance standpoint as in terms of like fuel for your performance um in in high quantities so we want to make sure that you know if you're especially the type of exercise we're doing here high intensity there's strength stuff there's some endurance but you know nothing longer than an hour so you're really not going to be utilizing that much fat for fuel unless it's low intensity so if you're doing really low intensity long efforts that's where your fat intake you know you might have to rely a little bit more on on fat intake but for the majority of what we're doing here at FTR, and if you have, you know, limited time to work out, for the most part, that's going to be carbohydrate focus. Doesn't mean fat doesn't have an important role in, the, in your total health. It's just we're not going to, we're not really, we don't really want to pinpoint fat around our workout time for various reasons, which we'll get into. So a couple other things we have on here, we talked about this last time, but, you know, with our fat, it's, a, it's an important part of heat, body heat regulation, right? We have our body fat stores that are gonna, um, you know, provide, provide us with thermal regulation. And then we also have, um, you know, that protection from our internal organs. But it's important to think like, dietary fat doesn't just mean all these fat stores on your body, okay? It doesn't work like that. We're not just eating fat and that, that contributes to fat stores. So it's important to differentiate the two. Um, 
And then, you know, what are, what are some sources of fat that are going to be your healthiest focus? Avocado. Yeah, nuts. Avocado, nuts. Peanut butter. What kind of nuts? Yeah. Ooh, okay. Peanut butter is so good. Peanut butter is great. What other types of, <laughs> what other types of nuts? What other types of nuts that, you know, that are also going to be beneficial to our Almonds. Almonds. Cashews. 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 Nathan. It's a lagoon. Pistachio. Pistachio. Yeah. There you go. All right. What about seeds? Let's talk about seeds because that's not something a lot of people Ooh. forget about seeds. Sunflower. Okay. Pumpkin. 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 Chia, flax seeds, flax seeds are going to be really flax. high in fiber what too. What about hemp? Hemp, hemp, hemp parts, parts, hemp parts are a type of seed. Yeah, so those are some really yeah. awesome yeah. things to add to your guys' intake if you're not already. Little thing, you know, you can add this to, you know, cereals or yogurt parfaits or oatmeal just to get in a little bit of, you know, healthy fat. Corona, so. what's, the, what's that diet again that we're supposed to eat all fat? The, the keto. Oh, the keto diet, yeah. 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 There you go. Yeah. So, uh, just the, what are the health problems with that? Uh, we covered that last time. Oh, you did? Oh, man. <laughs> well, I, to yeah. be fair, I didn't record Sorry. it because I, I messed up the recording <laughs> last time. Yeah, but we did we did talk about that last time. And the problem is it's such a high, you know, you can, you can certainly do a ketogenic diet or high fat yeah. diet in a very healthy manner. The problem is a lot of people use it as an excuse to eat tons like, of bacon, yeah. tons of fatty red meats. Um, really high fat dairy, which again, it's not it's not an issue to have some of those things, but when that's the majority of your intake, it's, it's just bad. It's, it's bad for your body. Too. Um, well, it's going to lead to a lot of like high cholesterol, and you're going to get a lot of that plaque buildup and fat buildup in places where you, you don't want it. Um, right. your, <laughs> maybe your abdomen. Oh, okay. like oh, internally. Oh, okay. Okay. Internal, internal, yeah, okay. yeah, okay. yeah. We're all <laughs> working for <more> that. <about>, uh, <laughs> Oh, got it. Got it. <laughs> Side note, okay. Um, okay, and then let's talk about protein. Okay, so I know just as a recap, we, we did talk about it last time a little bit. We're going to focus a little bit more on protein today. Um, but we did talk about how protein is really important for tissue growth and repair. So especially lean, lean muscle mass, that's going to be, you know, our muscles while they store carbohydrate and that's their primary fuel source, they are composed of or, or amino acids, which are the building blocks of protein, those are really important for the structure of our muscle tissue. Um, and so it's really important for that reparation process. Um, and then actually too, you know, from, from that standpoint, protein plays a really important role in injury prevention as well, right? Because if we don't have strong tendon, tendons and ligaments and muscles, um, or if we're not repairing those, that muscle tissue after it's been broken down during exercise, that can lead to um, improper recovery, which over time can, be, can lead to injury, right? A lot of muscle strains or tears or, um, you know, all, all types of injuries. So, um, so that's important. It also plays a really important function in our immune system. So that's something that a lot of people don't really think about with protein. So lots more than just from a musculature standpoint. So it's really important to think, you know, think a little bit in a broader sense when it comes to protein. Um, so let's talk, I wanna to touch on Chris's question with like calorie amounts and, and then we'll get into kind of how to determine what your macronutrient composition of your, you know, overall total energy intake should look like and how to figure that out a little bit. So it's a, it, it's a little bit, there's plenty of um, equations out there. I think the Harris Benedict equation is kind of your, a standard for a healthy population. You can plug in, you know, your height, age, weight, and come up and then your activity factor, depending on how, you know, how active or sedentary you are throughout the day, you get a pretty good rough estimate of what your overall calorie needs are, um, you know, for each and for each of you individually. So those can be a helpful starting place. The problem is that a lot of times, and you know, I see it a lot with talking with some individuals here, is that you're, let's say we did, let's say we did the, the, this formula and we came out to 2,000 calories. So let's just say for some reason, I, or, or just hypothetically, I need 2,000 calories a day based off of this Harris Benedict equation. Well, the issue with that is maybe I'm a chronic under eater, or maybe I, um, you know, maybe I don't, um, I, sk I skip meals. And so like I may have like one giant meal at the end of the day. So when I track, let's say I just 
track my food intake just to see where I'm at, I might come out to like, let's say 1400 calories. So then if I do that equation online, it comes out, oh, two, I need 2000 calories a day. So all of a sudden I start eating 2000 calories, but beforehand, because I've chronically been under eating and my body has metabolically adjusted down to a much lower intake. Now, if I add 600 calories to my day, every single day, I'm going to see some weight gain. So it doesn't work out. It's really important that we don't just use generic equations solely and base our intake off of, um, off of that particular. So my recommendation when I work with a lot of clients, um, I, you know, whether that's here individually, I, it's really important to take a food log or, or to write down or track depending on, you know, they're obviously if you're, you shouldn't necessarily track your food, um, in like an app, if that triggers you, right. If you've got a history with eating disorder, disorder eating, but it can be really helpful to see, okay, over the course of three to five, typical days, what do I, what's my calorie range? Like, what do I, what do I usually um, eat without trying to hit a certain number, just like tracking what you eat. So let's say I track, like you said, and I um, come out to 1400 calories a day, the Harris Benedict, HB, Harris Benedict equation tells me 2000 calories. Well, I'm not obviously, you know, I need to, I need to find some middle ground between those two to start out. That would be my first you know, if, if I'm working with you, let's, you know, I'm working with any of you in here, we need to take where you're at typically, like your average intake, and then where that kind of equation puts you at and find a middle ground there, you know? So maybe, okay, maybe at first it's just trying to get to like 1400 or 1500 consistently each day. And then bringing that number up very slowly, but surely over the course of, you know, several weeks to eventually get up to what my needs are. And then from there, you're, you're training your metabolism, you're getting your body used to a consistent intake, and that metabolic rate can start to speed back up. We can adjust our metabolism, just like, you know, if we're in a famine, and we're starving our, you know, we're, we're we, let's say we're a very active individual, we do a lot of sports, we've had plenty of access to food, and then all of a sudden there's a famine, right, and we're, and we have to reduce our intake. Well, we're going from a really fast metabolism, and now our body has to adapt. Right? And our bodies are very smart and then do that on their own um, over time. But your body can't distinguish between like an actual famine and you just restricting intake. And so it's going to make those metabolic adaptations when you under eat. Um, and so it's really important to know that you can adjust that. You know, you, you have the ability to change that, but it's, it's gradual. So it's a process. So you have to start slowly ramping that back up. Um, so that's. That's kind of in terms of starting calories to answer your question, Chris, to know where you're at. I'd say start out just tracking a couple of days of your intake, see where you're at currently. Now, and then if, if that's what, you know, let's say you come out to like 2,000 calories, well, you want to put on mass, you want to put on size, now you know, okay, well, I've got to go up from there, right? I got to start, maybe I'll start by like a 150 to 200 calorie increase and start <coughs> building that up slowly from there. Same with, it, with weight loss. You know, if you're, if you're a chronic under eater and you're at 1400 calories and you want to lose weight, well, unfortunately 1400 calories doesn't give you much room to go down. And so you're in a much better situation to start building up from there very slowly to get your, your metabolic rate back to working at a functional or at, at a proper, in a proper manner and then cutting instead of cutting from 1400. Cause I don't know many people who can, you know, survive on 1200 calories a day and be, you know, active and engaging and, and, you know, trying to sustain that for long periods of time. So anyway, that's a little bit of a side tangent, but I think it's important to kind of, obviously we're going to, based off our sheet here, we kind of have some percentages um, in terms of like, okay, what, how does the breakdown of your intake look like? And so I wanted to kind of start with that. Um, so let's talk about so there's two things, I think there's, there's, there's two things when it comes to, um, when it comes to health and performance nutrition to think about. And I have them written here, um, nutrient density and nutrient timing. So we talk about nutrient density, what comes to mind to me first is nutrients per calorie, right? That's kind of, you know, if you're thinking about a nutrient dense piece of food, that means it has a very high amount of nutrients for minimal calories. So if, what, what would be... What comes to mind when you, got, when I, when you guys hear like nutrient dense food? What foods do you think are really high nutrients and fairly on the lower end of the spectrum of calories? Broccoli. 
Yeah, broccoli. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Serena, yeah. you scare everyone when you talk. They're all like, what? Uh, <laughs> yeah, so broccoli or, you know, general, what's that? Green vegetables. <laughs> vegetables, yeah. Vegetables have one of the, the highest amounts of nutrients with the with the least amount of calories. And it's not, again, we're not, we're not trying to say like, oh, calories are bad. They're, they're not, we need them, right? But if we're trying to maximize the amount of nutrients per calorie, vegetables are going to be a great option. What else? Well, red meat. Red meat's not going to be, they have, you know, obviously red meats and, and all, all meats provide us with nutrients that fruits and vegetables don't necessarily provide us with, right? But they're going to be, red meat especially is going to be a higher calorie. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of great nutrients in red meat, but the amount of calories is also pretty high. So you're not getting the most bang for your buck there. Doesn't mean you can't include it, but again, if we're thinking about the most nutrient dense foods, they're going to be your, your fruits, your vegetables, um, fruits and vegetables as your top two. And then, you know, then it gets into some of the other, uh, minimally processed like plant foods. So like, you know, your, your, um, legumes and beans, those are going to be pretty, pretty high nutrient. Okay. Um, so that's kind of like in terms of nutrient density, we obviously went over the, the macronutrients. Micronutrients obviously are, you know, your, your vitamins and minerals, and those are going to be, um, you know, those are going to be very high in your plant foods, and especially these things called phytochemicals or phytonutrients, which are protective aspects of plants that animals don't have or any animal products don't have. So these are just found in plants and they're kind of like aspects of the plant that, that the plant needs for protection against, you know, whether it's environmental stress, stressors, or they, these are these adaptations that plants make over time, but they actually have really awesome health benefits for people, um, like anti carcinogens and, um, you know, antioxidants and, um, you know, a lot of cancer fighting, and disease fighting properties. So there's a lot of things that we're still learning about with plant foods that you can't extract in supplement form or you can't get from um, other types of foods that aren't just like naturally grown. So those are, that kind of has to do with our nutrient density. And then the other aspect is nutrient timing. So it's important to have, you know, focus on nutrient dense foods throughout your day, but it's, you know, when we're talking about performance, timing is in a really important, uh, component to that. Yes, Blake. Sorry, real quick. While we're on the nutrient density thing, yeah. What about um, like frozen vegetables and things like that? I, because I heard that a lot of the vitamins nutrients are water soluble, and so if you like steam them or boil them or whatever, you're taking out a lot of them. Yep, yeah, and that's a good and that's a good question with, with frozen and canned foods, and so. We'll start easy. We'll start with fruit first because fruit, most frozen fruit is actually pretty much taken at its peak ripeness um, and then just frozen. Sometimes there's a little vitamin C added to keep the, the freshness and the color in the fruits. But other than that, most frozen fruits will have a very similar um, nutrient, uh, nut nutrition properties as you know your, your whole fresh fruits. Um, when it gets into vegetables, you're, yes, you're going to lose, especially most vegetables, you know, you get frozen vegetables and they're still very brightly colored, right? When they come out of the bag, they're not just like these nasty green, like, like pea green looking vegetables. And so the reason for that is, you know, they've been boiled and then they've been blanched, which means they've been put immediately into cold water to stop the cooking process. And so that keeps that bright, those bright vegetable colors. So whether you, you steam or roast vegetables at home or just eating them raw, you're going to oftentimes will lose nutrients when, whenever you, throughout any of the cooking process with your fruits and vegetables. In certain, in certain fruits and vegetables, like tomatoes, for example, when you cook tomatoes, actually the, the property called lycopene, that actually comes out more when you cook them. So it's not always to say when you cook fruits and vegetables, you're, you're decreasing the amount of nutrients in it. That's not always the case. It's certainly changing it. Um, but that's why I recommend, like, if you're steaming, you know, if you're steaming vegetables, you can use that broth or that water to cook something else. Like if you're um, making rice and that rice is just going to soak up all that water, it's a, you know, recycling that water to keep most of the nutrients is, is certainly a good um, uh, roasting option. Them just in the oven. Roasting them in the oven, you know, again, you don't want to roast them until they're like 
completely crisp or too crisp, right? <laughs> then you're losing some of your Not necessarily. So say when you're when you're roasting, when you're uh, when you're sauteing, when you're when you're baking, when you're boiling. Um, you know, the less amount of time that you're that those are cooking for, you know, or you can kind of you don't like again, just not overcooking them will allow you to break, retain more of the nutrients. But they're still going to be highly nutritious, right? So, um, and again, if it makes you if Roasting your vegetables is going to have make allow you to be more excited about eating them over not including them at all. Obviously, you know, I would roast them. Go so roast them. It's, it's, Go for it. But in terms of can, you know canned foods, um, you know those have you know a lot of times those are soaked in you know there's a lot of salt in those um, or you know they have been cooked to some extent too. So again, in a spectrum, it's like sure fresh, maybe frozen, and then you know canned. Um, but, and, and obviously the cans have to be preserved a little bit, so there's gotta be some salt or some other things. Um, and then some, some of the fruits, some of the canned fruits that you'll find are gonna be like packed in syrup instead of water or they're just natural juices. So um, just all things to think about. But again, in the grand scheme of things, if that's gonna, you know, if you have, I have a bunch of frozen vegetables in my freezer because if I run out of fresh and I, again, I'm lazy, if, if there's a day and I'm like, or maybe I'm too busy and I can't go to the store, I'd rather have some backup options, right? Um, so it's always, you know, it's important to think in the grand scheme of things, what's going to set you up better for success. Um, so, but in terms of nutrient timing, okay, this is the most important part. And I obviously want to be mindful of your time. So I want to get into, um, the timing aspect. Um, so I didn't really, I don't know that I put this on, um, on your guys' sheet, unfortunately. Actually, I guess we can kind of, um, uh, we can kind of look at this. Um, but what I think the, the most important thing to think about workout um, is that during strength or endurance training, we talked about carbohydrates being the primary fuel source. So let's talk pre-workout just for a second here, okay? And then, and this is actually, this athlete's training, athlete's plates are kind of helpful in terms of um, determining, and I'm going to show you guys what I'm looking at here. But the athlete's plates are going to be helpful. Oh no, Andy! Andy bumped out. So he's been waiting. Sorry, Andy. Oh my gosh, I'm sorry. At least you can watch the recording, right? So um, <laughs> with the athlete's plates here, guys. Um, again, we've talked about this before, but basically the the main difference between like an easy training day or a, a day where you're trying to, you know, you're, you're being or maybe during a period where you're trying to be more weight conscious, um, you know, half your fruits, half your plates, fruits and vegetables, a quarter of that is whole grain or ideally as whole, as whole as possible, as possible. But obviously, you know, that grain section can be, um, can be adjusted even more if you are really trying to cut back on some calories and then lean protein, obviously that that's going to stay pretty consistent across the board. Um, and so speaking of protein real quick, I think it's important to talk about, um, it's important to talk about protein over the course of your day. So in terms of, in terms of suggestions, and I, I thought I'd, I thought I'd break this down for you guys, but for protein, we're really going to be looking for total daily intake, especially as active individuals, you're going to be looking at like 1.4 to 2 grams per kilogram per day. Of, of protein. So I want you guys to just take out your phones real quick and do that math. So so take, find out how many kilograms of body weight you are. So take your weight divided by 2.2 and then hang on to that number. So maybe write down that number at the top of your sheet, just, just, just so you know how many kilograms you are. Then multiply whatever you get by 1.4 and that's your bottom end range 2. of protein. Divide by 2.2. And then multiply that by 1.4. So, and then write that number down. That's your that's your low end range of protein. And then take your kilograms again, and then multiply that. So your body weight divided by 2.2. Now multiply that by two, and that's going to be kind of your high end range of protein. And that's your daily. You know, that's going to be. It's a pretty big range. Um, and but that's kind of what's what's going to be your overall. You're super Ella. Andy, we can hear you. But oh, shoot. I'm so sorry. Well, I, forgot <laughs> to it. I forgot. You, and I'm so sorry that we that you were bumped out and we just admitted you. So. Yeah, my daughter closed it. I'm so sorry. I'm, 
<laughs> hey, you're good, Andy. We love you. So you okay, so we everyone has their range. What's the math form there again? Take so your weight, body weight, weight yeah, divided by two point two kilograms. Yeah, times and whatever. now you're gonna either multiply. I want you to multiply that number by one point four. And two. Four, just one point four. Write that down, and then take your kilograms again. Do it by two, and that's your final. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's so now let's just say, for example, I'm gonna go kind of off of me. Let's say, um, oh, I can't remember, I think it's like 90 to let's say 115. Let's just say that's our, the range we're working with. Studies are showing that for protein, it's really important to, it's less important about my total number for the day and more important about spacing that protein out throughout the day. Uh, because, and I wish I could put this out. Better. But basically, if we have time on our x-axis, and then our, our y-axis is, let's just say it's muscle uh, muscle protein synthesis, which means basically muscle growth, right? Um, we're going to have these, these like waves across our day every time we eat. So um, what this means, so um, I'm not sure if I'll explain this. But um, <laughs> basically, you can achieve, studies are showing that, um, oh, this is actually protein intake, sorry. This is gonna be your protein intake throughout the day. So studies are showing that around this 20 grams of protein, and this is obviously, it's gonna be a little bit different depending on your body weight, your body size. So let's just say for a really small, person, it's going to be like 15 grams, let's say for a bigger person, maybe it's 25 to 30 grams, okay? Um, but they found in studies that that sweet spot at 20 grams is the amount that maximally stimulates muscle growth, muscle protein synthesis across the day. More than that, you're not going to get extra. Below that, you're not quite reaching that cap. And so with protein, we don't, our bodies don't store protein. Uh, we have a constant pool of amino acids, which are the building blocks building blocks of protein um, and when we eat protein when we consume protein we have additional amino acids in that pool that our body can use and our muscles can use when we have gone long periods of time without protein and our body needs protein it takes it from our muscles and that's kind of muscle degradation or um, muscle breakdown which we don't if you're trying to get stronger right and try to build muscle mass you don't want to be in that muscle degradation phase or that catabolism, right? For catabolic, it means our muscles are breaking down. So we don't want to be in that phase for very long. So instead of thinking like, okay, well, I'm going to have like one, two meals a day. I'm going to do 45 grams of protein at one, 45 grams the other. That means I've hit my 20 gram cap. I've gone up to here, but it doesn't do anything in addition after that 20 grams. And I've done that twice throughout my day. So now I've hit my maximum muscle protein stimulus twice in a day. Whereas if I took that same amount and I just broke it up into 20 grams, so let's say, so I did 245 bouts during the day, and then in, and then for the same amount, let's say I did two, four, six, eight. Let's just say I did, to get to 90, I did four different feeding win periods, but at 20 to 25 grams of protein. Now, I've, I'll be able to stimulate more muscle growth more times throughout the day. One, two, three, four times throughout the day as opposed to two. Does that make sense? A little mm -hmm. bit? So we want, we want to ride that wave. Ideally, we'd want to stimulate muscle growth more times throughout the day than fewer times. So that's why that spreading out of the protein across the day is kind of the more important um, thing to pay attention to when it comes to protein ingestion rather than... Um, rather than just, oh, let me reach my target, and I'm gonna have this ginormous 70 gram of protein steak at one sitting, and, and I'll be good. So it's important to think about spreading those out throughout the day, okay? So, you know, if we think about that, let's say, um, you know, let's say we were trying to aim for, let's make it a nice number here, let's just say it's 120. Let's say we're trying to aim for 120 grams of protein throughout our day, and this is where food, Meal and snack frequency is really important in your day. So um, let's say I'm aiming for like 25 grams of protein per meal, right? But I'm trying to get to 120. Well, that means, let's say if it's 20, 25 grams of protein and I need to get to 120, that's going to be five. Five times 20 is 120, right? So 
if I don't really want to go too much higher than 20 grams of protein at a meal, that means I kind of have to eat five times, you know, five different instances throughout the day. So that can help me plan out, you know, what my meals and snacks need to look like. So that might mean breakfast, lunch, dinner, 20, 20, 20, or maybe those are closer to 30. So, and then, you know, I have two snacks, snack one and two, and those are either, in this case here, it would be another 20 grams, or I can make these closer to 30, three, six, nine, and then um, do 15 and 15. So this, one of these options could be great for a post-workout, right? Oh, I'm gonna have a snack after, right after I finish my workout, and then maybe an hour and a half later, an hour or two later, I'll have a full-blown meal with another, you know, a little bit more protein in there. Um, and then, you know, sometime throughout the rest of the day, I'm gonna get fit in another 15 grams of protein at a different snack. So sometimes, and, and I, I think protein's probably the one that, we've, that helps dictate more of that, that meal and snack breakdown throughout your day, a little bit more than carbs and fat, because, because of this, right? If we can't, if we're not getting too much extra bang out of our buck by going giant amounts of protein and we need to spread these out, well, it's pretty easy to fit some fat and carbs in with my different snacks here with protein. So protein is kind of gonna help dictate a little bit of you know, your food frequency. At least, you know, it can be helpful to think that way. Uh, especially if muscle growth is your, or, or muscle gain is kind of your objection. Now, if it's not, you can afford to go bigger period, longer periods of time between meals, and you don't have to worry about being catabolic or having, you know, some of that muscle breakdown occurring. Um, because it's, you know, you're, you're, um, you don't need to stimulate that, that growth as much. Okay. So would it make sense to like wake up in the middle of the night, have a protein bar? Not in the middle of the night. It's, it, it's <laughs> definitely important. That's no, a good question though. Um, cause if you're just like, oh my gosh, I want to get as many of these as possible. Um, so someone like you, like your feeding window might look like, okay, I'm going to wake up and eat, eat right away. And then you're spacing that out a couple of hours, you're eating snacks until you go to bed. But it's, it's important to also give your body a break from constant digestion and ingestion of food. Because if your body's constantly working on that, the digestion process, A, and then the light's gonna disrupt your sleep, and you're not gonna be able to reach that REM sleep or that deepest sleep cycle, because your body's, part of your body's still very much awake digesting food. Um, but then also, we wanna give our body time to clear out waste products and do more like cell maintenance. Um, that's and, and digestion and absorption of nutrients is gonna take away from that. So you kind of wanna, so it's important at night to, you know, I, I wouldn't recommend waking up necessarily in the middle of the night having a bunch of, of food, um, just to just to give your body that break, that rest period. Sometimes of, my of body digestion. breaks me up in the middle of the night. Okay. It demands it. Um, <laughs> I do. I don't know, that might be your be, brain. <laughs> yeah. Guys, I think this might be a two part, because it's already 726, and I want to be mindful of everyone's time. This might, I, I, we've scratched the surface a little bit. I do want to talk more about like application. Of, mm. so, so what does this look like from a, like we've talked about amounts, but like now how do we translate that into, okay, what should I eat to hit that number or, you know, to hit these numbers of protein or, or what does it look like to have, you know, a pre-workout snack or what should a post-workout snack actually look like? So I know we didn't get as much into yeah, that. Yeah, it could be a whole to. class. It could that's, be, it could be a whole, it could be very long. That's so, a perfect cliffhanger. I'm going to come next to you. <laughs> yes, that's right. I just want, so, so I'm hanging, hanging the carrot, but um, hopefully this gives you guys a little bit of, you know, some things to think about. Um, in turn, because you guys have one more week till you know we come back to this class, I want to leave you with this. We talked about we talked about protein. We talked about a little bit, and I'll talk more about this. But carbohydrates for next time and how that's fueling our workouts. So, if you know as as you continue this week and go into next week with your training, I really want you to focus on protein and carbohydrate intake around your food uh, around your workouts. And try to leave the fat a little bit further away from the workouts. We've said this before, but fat is takes much longer to digest, and it's a very inefficient. It's, our, it's not our body's primary fuel source. Um, it's it's not very efficient to mobilize fat stores to create energy or ATP for us, you know, during a workout. And so, you know, having fat before leading into your workout is not going to be as effective as having you know carbohydrate and, and a little bit of protein before that too. So. 
if I were to leave you with one word of advice for your immediate pre and post workout snack, um, is is to just leave the fat out a little bit, or keep the fat pretty low on those, and focus more on your your protein and carbohydrate. And if you have a, if you let's say um, let's say you do like Sean, you said Cliff you, you, the Cliff Bar. So um, let's say you have your um, let's <laughs> say. Let's say you have your lunch, so hopefully your lunch looks something like, you know, unless you're going crazy hard, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's an easy day or maybe it's a, a moderate training day on our athlete's plate. So that's going to be, this is kind of going to apply mostly to like our big meals, right? Because snacks are going to be obviously much more condensed than this. But let's say if you're doing the 4.30 or 5.30 class, your last big meal before the class should look like, you know, one of these mm -hmm. depending on, you know, how, how active or what you're training day looks like um and then you should have a snack you know you know because let's say you meet at 12 and you're not working out till 5 30 which is a very long time you know it's a pretty long time to go without food and you maybe you need a little pick me up before your workout so in that case mostly carbohydrates a little bit of protein would serve you well in your workout because you're going to be utilizing carbohydrates most of your workout so during that snack decrease the fat a little bit. We don't need to focus too much on the fat because you're going to be using carbs in your workout. Um, and that's going to be a, a great fat or a great snack source. So a little protein, carbohydrate. And then after, say 6.30, you go home and dinner's available right then and there. Well, you know, focus on protein, focus on carbohydrates. Um, you can have a little bit of fat at dinner too. But we don't want to just bombard our system with high fat before, high fat after, because it's going to slow those nutrients from getting to our muscles and we need to get that recovery ASAP. Mm. So protein and carbs are going to be, but we'll talk more about that next time. So I really, I do think this is a, a two part at least. Um, and then that will leave our third class to kind of talk more about supplements and, um, and, and all that fun stuff that, that you guys want to talk about with energy drinks and pre-workout. Yeah. Any, any final thoughts um, from you, you Andy or Serena or any of you guys here? Um, before we finish, yes, please. Where does hot sauce fall? Because I feel like that's right. <laughs> I love hot sauce. That's, that, that's, that's a staple part. It falls in the flavors. That's going to be drizzled all so. over. Um, yeah, any, spices. Any, any for real questions? I do have one question. <laughs> hey, for Serena. Serena, did you have a question? Yeah. If you could say one definite pre-workout snack is your go-to, what would you say? Uh, that's a great question. I think, like I said, for, for carbohydrates, especially like quicker carbohydrates that are still nutrient dense, I think fruit is, is a great go-to. Banana is a great one because it's going to be butter. banana and peanut butter. And peanut butter, especially if you're not going too crazy with the peanut butter, I think a tablespoon or two would be is max in terms of fat or fat. What about that peanut butter? RX nut butter that has like the egg white in it? Oh, too? yeah. That's the RX, RX nut butter would be good too. Um, so yeah, that's a great question. I think pro, I think, um, like those low sugar, um, hold on guys. Yeah, I think that low sugar Chobani that we have in the uh -huh. fridge is a great one. Cause it has a little bit, it's about 10 grams of protein and it has maybe like 15, 20 grams of carbs, or you could do your own yogurt and like plain yogurt with, with fruit and a little honey or something. But yeah, that's, or like a little bowl of cereal, like a low sugar, high high fiber, high protein, you know, healthy cereal with some with some milk. Rice checks would be great with a little milk or protein, you know, higher protein milk. Yeah, great question though. But yeah, I really want to get more into the application part next time of like, okay, let's give you guys ideas so that you know that that actually looks like and how that translates. Okay. Appreciate y'all tuning in. Thanks for being here, guys. I'm going to stop the recording. Awesome. All right.